Okay. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much for joining us today um, and welcome to our session, which is about attracting new talent into adult social care. Uh, my name's Anna Sheard and I'm going to be your host for the next 45 minutes. Um, if you're familiar with City and Guilds, thank you very much for joining. If you're new to City and Guilds, who, who is hosting the event today, um, we're a charity and everything that we do is about helping people into a job, on the job, or into the next job. Um, and health and social care is a key focus for us at City and Guilds. Um, and as everybody is aware at the moment, the, the pandemic has really exacerbated the, the skills gaps within the sector, um, meaning that skilled workers are needed more than ever. Um, and what we'd really like to do is focus on bringing you some up-to-date latest industry information around recruitment. Um, and so we're absolutely delighted to invite our first speaker for the day, Kate Shoesmith, um, to join me on camera and, and um, is going to share her expertise with us within the sector. Um, just a couple of things before I um, start talking to Kate as well. Please feel free to have your cameras on if you'd like to ask a question as we go through the session, if you want to use the uh, reactions on the the Zoom, uh, Zoom functionality and just raise a hand, I'll come to you. Um, alternatively, you can put your comments or your questions in chat. Um, we've got 45 minutes today and lots of information that we'll be covering. Um, if we don't get a chance to answer everybody's questions, we'll make sure that we pick them up after the session. Uh, we're recording the session and we'll make the recording available if there's any colleagues you'd like to share it with afterwards. And equally, if you go away and you've got further questions, um, please feel free to come back to us as well. Um, so thank you very much, Kate, for joining us today. Delighted to, delighted to see you. Um, and just to begin with, I guess, Kate, for, for people on the call who might not be familiar with the REC, um, could you just tell us a little bit about the organisation um, and, and, and what the REC stands for and, and what you're all about? Yeah, of course. Anna, thank you very much for inviting me to join today. So um, I work for uh, the Recruitment and Employment Confederation, which is a very wordy uh, title for a company. Um, we're the professional membership organisation for UK recruiters. Um, so we have about 3000 companies in our membership. They all sign up to this code of professional practice, which means that they understand the, the regulations, the legislation that's around recruiting the right way. Um, but what they also must do is they must understand the ethics of what we think is important in recruitment. So respect for each other, diversity and inclusion, transparency, um, and we can hold them to account for that. And we make each of our members take a, a test every day an exam to stay in membership um, and then part of our network um, represents the health and the care sectors which is um, a really important um, side of uh, where we're recruiting for so we have about 450 companies that exclusively recruit in health and care and I, I remember before I worked for City and Guilds, I worked in recruitment and I've taken the REC exam and it's really hard. <laughs> it is, it's, it's deliberately robust, isn't it? So it's actually making sure that people are maintaining those standards. So, um, and, and in terms of uh, kind of recruitment, obviously at the moment, uh, kind of Kate, we've, we've got a lot of people today that are working in adult social care at the moment and interested in maybe what the kind of data is telling you about that sector at the moment. As you mentioned there, you've got 450, uh, kind of members working there what's your kind of view on on what's going on within the sector at the moment and the factors that, that may be influencing that mm. so so one of the things that you get because you'll know this Anna as having been a recruiter is that you can see exactly what's happening in the jobs market um, almost immediately um, when something changes um, and we we collect an awful lot of information so we collect data on placement rates so people being recruited into permanent and into temporary interim roles and there's a lot of interim roles we find in care actually um, and we also collect data about pay and salary um, and about uh, staff availability so one of the things that we know is we've been doing a something called a jobs recovery Oh, I think Kate's just frozen there. Yeah, I can see Claire. <laughs> Claire Woods is nodding. Can anybody else? Yeah, can you still hear me okay? Yeah, it's, it's the joys, isn't it, of, uh, of kind of technology during COVID. We've all got much better at being adaptable 
I often have my daughter kind of jumping in at some point during a call as well. <laughs> so I think what Kate was uh, potentially talking about there is she was um, kind of frozen was about jobs tracking data. And um, so be it by being able to see the, the kind of availability um, of jobs within the sector, I just take the opportunity while um, Kate's kind of hopefully reconnecting just to kind of throw out to, to the floor, really, if anybody, if there's particular issues, kind of questions um, that you might want us to kind of cover today or, or to ask Kate. Um, I think she's logged off, so she'll be logging back in. Um, does anybody uh, kind of want to just share a little bit about kind of what your experience is at the moment? Feel free to pop it in comments if you if you don't want to, to speak. What I'm going to do is I'm going to come to um, my colleague Joe. So Joe, we're going to be talking. Oh, sorry, Suzanne. I think Suzanne's raising a hand. Hi, Suzanne. <laughs> oh, I think you're on mute, Suzanne. If you want to just come off mute, that would be brilliant. Thank you. Great. <laughs> I'm in the charity sector. I work at Age UK in North Tyneside, um, and we are finding it very hard to recruit at the moment. Um, you know, we have our, our feelers out all over the place um, and normally we don't have a problem. But, um, right. you know, during COVID, everybody stayed where they were. Um, but now they're starting to move around a little bit and it's hard to replace them. Um, and I think, um, you know, money's coming to certain places and not to other places to actually fund workers. And I think it's hard because... Some people have got funded and some people haven't. Yeah. And where you say, Suzanne, um, thanks ever so much for, for kind of sharing about people kind of moving. Are you finding that people are moving to other um, kind of care providers or moving out of the sector completely? A bit of both, really. A bit right. of both. Or they're wanting to get higher within the organisation. Like to say, instead of being a carer, they want to go into like the um, the paramedics or nursing, or which is great. It's a great stepping stone for them. But it's the people who are leaving the organisation because, you know, it's getting too much for them. Yeah. And do you think that's kind of it? So you mentioned that you've not had a problem or it's not been as 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 difficult in the past but it's certainly become more difficult now as you're backfilling those roles which like you say great if people are moving in and and kind of wanting to stay within the sector but you need that succession planning don't you to keep that stable workforce and do you think that is directly kind of with the pandemic that that's kind of influenced people feeling like they don't want to be in the sector at the moment as a, as a new kind of career option or is there other um, things going on th there's not that many coming into the um, to the organisation without that profession yeah. um, at the moment, I haven't found anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's great. Thanks ever so much, mm -hmm. Suzanne. Is it be really interesting? Is, has that been anybody else's experience? Has anybody else kind of found that? Um, I think as Suzanne was saying there, it's maybe people kind of that, that it's actually a first career kind of going into the sector, or, or that you're finding that you're losing talent to, to kind of other areas. Has anybody else got similar experiences or, or any different experiences that you might want to share? But it's great to great to kind of contribute as we go through. And if anybody else would like to share, please uh, you know please drop a um, drop a note in the comments or put your hand up. I think Kate has rejoined us as well. Um, hi, Kate. <laughs> Hello. Can, can you hear me? Okay. So let's start with that. Yes, we can hear you. We Brilliant. Hear I'm, you. I'm I'm really sorry. My internet is obviously not doing great this morning. So I'm going to leave my camera off if that's okay. Yeah, absolutely. I think we're all um, either kind of in a storm or on the edge of a storm at the moment. I know a couple of colleagues have got um, Wi-Fi and power connection issues as well. So <laughs> I think that we're all here is, is great. And we were just hearing, um, Kate, I'm not sure where you came in, but um, Suzanne from Age UK was just sharing a little bit about some of the challenges that they're facing in terms of, um, you know, people uh, kind of like leading um, um, into uh, kind of some people into progression pathways in the sector, some people out of the sector, but there isn't necessarily that succession planning where people are coming in fresh to, to kind of backfill those vacancies and I think where we left off was just a little bit about the job tracking data so actually mm. what the data is telling you at the moment in terms of those live vacancies so if we pick back up there um, yeah. and if you can just tell us a little bit more about that that would be great. Yeah absolutely so I'm really sorry so let me just repeat myself in case people didn't hear so so what I'm saying is that we have this jobs recovery tracker that we've been using it throughout the pandemic to see what's happening in the jobs market we saw that um, for many sectors 
sectors that recruitment literally went on pause in the lockdown in March 2020. Totally understandably, um, for many businesses, they just uh, they thought it would be better to hold off hiring anyone. But there were exceptions to that. And care is one of those exceptions. As of the last week of November, um, there were 190 um, 100,916 vacancies, job adverts that were live for care workers. And to put that into context, what I was um, uh, saying previously was that we have 13,000 live job adverts for HGV drivers. So think about all the media headlines you see where you talk about shortage of drivers. Um, and we're saying 13,000 job adverts there that are live, 100,000 in care. It's huge, the number of people we're seeking to hire in this industry. Yeah, that's, I'm, I'm really surprised. I mean, I kind of, you know, obviously we kind of work in the sector at City and Guild, and so we're, we're aware of that, but I didn't make that correlation between like the HGV drivers and like you say, the amount of publicity and kind of space given to the crisis there as opposed to the kind of the, the skills crisis in care so yeah that's a it's very stark kind of seeing those statistics against each other and and are they across temporary and permanent vacancies Kate do you kind of uh, disaggregate the data to that level or is that across all vacancies that that is across all vacancies um what I can tell you that is that the demand is particularly acute for permanent um people um and and there it's carers it's healthcare assistants, um, it's um, nurses, and, and on the temporary side, the one that's um, particularly uh, key is social care and domiciliary workers. So those, there are differences in terms of that vacancy data. Um, and we do know, you know that um, um, care homes have had a particular challenge um, in terms of recruiting people and retaining their staff over the pandemic. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And where, and where do you think, so just really interested in picking up that point about the comparative data with things like your HGV drivers, is it is health and social care, is this, is this where the, the biggest vacancies are across all sectors or do you see any other kind of sectors that have similar kind of skill shortages at the moment? The, the key the key actually is it's health and care that are always the top okay. of the list in terms of um, demand um, right. but, but what's um, what we've found is that this is something that predates the pandemic so we've um, we've been looking at um, jobs data for many years and in the in the 24 years that um, REC has been collecting um, data um, tracking the the jobs data for report on jobs which is our monthly summary of what's happened in the month just gone um, we've never seen spikes like it in terms of candidate uh, availability candidates as in people that are looking to move jobs we've never seen it as low um, as it has been in recent months. Um, and there's many factors that are around this. So we've got historic reasons for uh, there being um, such a high demand for people working in care. We have an aging population for one. Yeah, I think we might have just lost, lost Kate there as well. I can, see I can hear, I can hear, you can hear us, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect, <so that's> <laughs> We can hear you again. That's that's great. So yeah, so they kind of so there's always been so so just kind of reflecting on some of the things that you said there. So it's always been the kind of the the top sector, if you like, in terms of of kind of vacancies. But it's uh, been exacerbated through the pandemic, but also then combined with the fact that there's real spikes in now actually people not moving, people not actually moving into the sector. So it kind of feels like a, a an area that's already difficult and facing kind of challenges. It is just now at a point where it's almost a, a kind of a crisis point because you've actually not got that candidate kind of movement in the market either. Um, that's and what exactly. Yeah. Yeah, Anna, and this and there's the and the, the other point is there's that there's the uh, the aging population that we have in the UK. Yeah. So some of these trends are being exacerbated by lo much longer term trends that we're seeing. Um, we we you know there is there is a sense of our uh, overall availability of people to do some of these roles um, has declined, and at the same time the demand for the roles has gone up. So you've got that perfect storm in that supply and demand equation. Yeah, and it's funny because as, as you were talking there, I was thinking about the kind of the aging population. I, I think I'd interpreted that as almost like more demand on the services from kind of care providers. But actually, mm -hmm. like you say, in terms of the aging population from a skills perspective as well, is that actually absolutely. 
kind of the perfect storm, isn't it, of, of kind of combination of, of things that are actually making it very difficult. Um, and obviously one of the things that, um, you know, kind of, you know, may, may be a, a concern for people at the moment is about kind of mandatory vaccinations being um, being kind of brought in. Um, and and what, do you, what feedback are you getting from from your members in terms of maybe kind of vaccinations or the kind of other challenges like and 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 where where is the voice if you like in terms of kind of recruitment within the sector um, mm. to, to and putting forward those challenges and what role does REC play in that yeah so we so we did ask our members um about this specifically um and and I have to say that 75 percent of members when we, we we polled them and they said they did they did understand the call for there to be vaccination of staff um particularly frontline um workers so so they were they were personally supportive however they were not supportive of the mandatory nature of it because they knew it immediately would cause um, a greater issue in terms of um, recruiting. And um, because they're, they're, the estimates were is about 20% of the population working in um, care were not vaccinated at the time that the, man, uh, the mandatory call was brought in and that we would lose people from the industry. They have found that they are. Um, they have found that some people have decided that actually they would rather work in a different setting um, than take a vaccination. But, but there was other reasons. It wasn't just the vaccination. So one of the things that happened over the pandemic is in some situations, people didn't feel that they were necessarily um, supported overall by um, the government um, intentions around the pandemic and about uh, how, how the pressure that was put on people. And we would speak to many care homes where they would say that their staff were making a straight out choice between a minimum wage job for them because that's all they could afford to pay them versus a minimum wage job in retail. And that and that's such a shame because there's people with a vocation that were saying they didn't they didn't feel that they were necessarily getting the overall support that they um, they would require at this really testing time. And they might as well go and do a job where they could work in other sectors um, for less pressure. And that just feels like it's such a, a missed opportunity um, when you've also and you add to that the, uh, the mandatory vaccination, you know, forget people's personal views on vaccination policy. Um, it just it, it was that it was a sense of an overall package, making it really difficult for people to make a choice to work in care at this time. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Kate. And I think there's a really important point that you, you kind of made there. And I'll just I can see my colleague Geraldine's got a hand up. So I'll, I'll come to you in a second, Geraldine, as well. But, um, about that point about being a vocation and actually kind of people you know what is it that makes people choose um, you know what is a challenging and, and i'm sure very kind of rewarding but a very hard kind of role within a sector that you know can often feel very underappreciated um, and not given the space um, and and the kind of the, the credit of, of services that often within our own lives we might be recipients of as well um, or have experience of people within our families or networks that are recipients of that care um, and and i think um it's something we've kind of talked about in the past about that kind of uh, that alignment of values and that kind of values based recruitment and how do we actually kind of promote it as a vocational option so I'll, I'll kind of come back to you in a sec Kate and just ask about kind of values based recruitment and a little bit more about some of those kind of practical steps but I'll just go over to Geraldine I can see you've got your hand up Geraldine um, just to, to kind of bring you in. Hi, oh, yeah, thank you I'll put my hand down in a minute because I'll have to work out how to do it but uh, yeah it was about I said to Anna, let's not talk about the vaccination and the mandatory vaccination denying of that. But I just wonder whether it might have been better to take the approach that the government's taken with health, whereby they've been given a long time to get to that stage where people are vaccinated, to, to allow people to go through the first dose, second dose scenario, rather than just say, you know, because the, the, the date for care is gone. And um, and it has it has caused problems for, for people, you know, I'm not being judgmental about people who, who take or don't want to take the vaccine. But but the. The stats show that that people didn't have the vaccine and therefore they've, they've had to leave. But I, I just wondered um, from Kate's perspective, whether. Her organisation. Um, believes that the government pledge to build back better is going to make a difference to social care because there's going to be money put into 
recruiting and uh, and also skills development which we'll probably talk about mm -hmm. next time um but i just wondered if 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 there was any sign of that kurt so i think Gerald, it's a really important point it's only it's only going to work if there's a true partnership model isn't there um and i, and I think one of the things that we've really been missing is a a sense from government that what we need to start with is where's the where's the big picture workforce plan for this sector um, we know that we're having to recruit people on an almost ad hoc basis to make sure that there's safe patient care levels um, and that um, it means that people are having to move around uh, between different roles and that it's really hard for care home providers um, to, to know what the, um, the available source of workers is going to be for them um, on any given day. And, and that's because we always dealing with the short term we need that long term big picture thinking we you know we've we've just said we we know we have an aging population we can map that out we we can figure out how many people are likely to require some form of um care support in the future and we can figure out what types of jobs because we've got the long term data where we've really seen that demand and then we can build the the careers guidance support materials we need we can build the qualification structures we need instead of which we always feel like we're responding rather than being proactive and and that direction of travel has to be set at government and it's not it's not political to say this because i think it doesn't matter what the um the party of government is that workforce plan with the NHS and social care right at the heart of it should be all important. And it's not, it's always done as the add-on. It's always seen as, or oh, let's recruit for people. Let's try and get as many nurses in as possible now by offering a bonus. That's fine, it's great, but where's the big picture? Mm. I mean, interesting actually, Kate, when you, you kind of say that and some really, really good points. And thank you, Geraldine, as well, for, for, for kind of bringing, uh, bringing your perspective to that. You mentioned about kind of REC collecting data for like 24 years, I think it was mm -hmm. that you mentioned, and, and you know, health and, and care always been kind of the sector where there's been the biggest gaps. Is, it, is that being consistent across that kind of period of time that, you know, that you've been collecting data that this has been on? Just trying to get a sense of kind of like it feels like these issues have been exacerbated, but is it is it always been there and it's just never been resolved, like you say, by any kind of... <laughs> any yeah, I'm in, afraid... In, in, in uh, yeah. it's, uh, the, the, the disappointing bit is is yes um so health and care is always in the top three of most in demand self sectors and i'm and i'm always combining health and care because there's such a crossover in terms of um some of the data i know there's very different professions within that um but it's uh, uh so the digital skills is is one of the other areas and engineering so all of the things you hear about um where you, you know where we talk about our technical needs and about how do we need to be um a, a technolo technologically enabled country and put technical skills right at the forefront it's something that we've never managed to um to really um address in the in the the years that we've been collecting the data mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that, so it's it, it. What I'd, I'd like to do is just just spend a few minutes, if that's okay, Kate, as well. And I know, kind of, um, and I'm sure a lot of the kind of information, uh, you know, resonates with people that are on the call today and people working in the sector and who are experiencing those challenges on a day to day basis. Um, and just to kind of understand where might there be things around recruitment, where there might be kind of resources available, there might be um, the opportunity to kind of share best practice with each other and, and try to kind of maybe look at some of the kind of day-to-day -day things that, that might support with some of those challenges. And I know obviously kind of with the REC, you, you kind of represent um, recruiters, um, but also you, you have support available for employers as well. And I'd like to just kind of spend time just looking at both of those perspectives. So if some people um, are kind of working with recruitment agencies at the moment, particularly for contingent labour, um, if you have any kind of tips or best practice in terms of how do you get the most out of your recruitment agency? Um, and then after that, we'll just have a little look at kind of maybe some support or kind of best practice around some of the uh, kind of in-house recruitment practices and resources that you have available as well if that's okay 
Um, so yeah, if we just start with kind of like, obviously, I think a lot of people within the sector, like you say, we'll, we'll kind of rely on agency and we'll be looking at contingent labour. Is there any tips that you have for people in terms of how to work with your agencies and, and, and kind of that partnership working to make sure um, that you're getting the best out of that relationship? Dramatic pause. <laughs> I think can you, can you hear me yeah. okay yeah <laughs> yeah we can hear Brilliant. you I I will make sure that um I speak quite loudly as well now <laughs> so uh, <laughs> one of uh so over the pandemic we've really noticed that it it helps to have a very honest conversation with your recruitment partners where do you see uh, the challenges what is particularly important to you as a business um, individuals are making um, very clear decisions about the type of company um, and organization whether it's in the public or the private sector that they want to work for right now um, we've all been through an awful lot over the pandemic and having a serious conversation with a recruiter that isn't just about how do you source somebody for x job it's about where what's the what type of uh, people you're working with um who who you think would be best fit for your organization is it just a case of i just desperately need somebody to fill this position right now and the rest of it can follow but try and think about it in a in a in a bit bigger sense and give the recruiter as much information as possible and then hold the recruiter accountable if they tell you that they're going to get back to you within x amount of time and they're going to provide you with x number of cvs and uh, this type of support material then make sure they do it if they don't then you need to be holding them up a mirror up against them and say well, why aren't you doing that because you, you've got a very very important job to do um, and they need to be fulfilling their obligations to you because it's all important right now so and if you've got a particular concern you can report them um to the to the rec because we will investigate any complaint against a member of ours and we can um and we can go through due processes on that in terms of if you are looking for advice around how do you do the recruitment in a way that really helps you best as an organization we have something called um, our good recruitment campaign and we've got a number of guides there which just talk about things like what is it that would be um, most useful in terms of attracting candidates at this particular point in time? Um, and, and where can you go for more support? And so there's about there's a network of over 500 companies that are signed up. All of the materials are available for free on our website. If you just um, if you go to there's a there's a tab at the very top of our website that says for employers and you can click in and you can see all of the information there. And it gives it gives some starting points of what to do in terms of thinking about recruitment in the right possible way. Mm -hmm. And they're brilliant resources as well. I was kind of looking looking over them this morning before we started the call today. It's very clear, accessible, um, and and kind of easy to use resources that do guide you through those kind of steps. Um, so I would recommend, and we'll send a link round for everybody to, to have a look at those resources. And um, just to say as well, if anybody's got any questions for Kate, please raise your hand or put them in comments as well, and we'll make sure we kind of cover those before we close the session today. Um, so in terms of, I suppose, just to kind of summarise, Kate, some of the key things we've talked about. So obviously as a sector, like you say, in the top three sector um, areas in terms of uh, skills gaps um, and kind of issues facing uh, kind of recruitment in the sector, it's been an issue that's been going on, um, you know, for, for a long period of time, but it's certainly been exacerbated by the pandemic. And also what has further exacerbated that is the lack of movement of candidates candidates within the market um, and also the other factors in terms of ageing workforce um, and the fact that the lack of, um, I suppose, support, as you mentioned there, that you've kind of had feedback over the kind of course of the pandemic where people are given stark choices between actually working in, in a sector like retail or working in care where they don't necessarily feel um, as supported or valued within that kind of role. Um, and in terms of some of the areas that 
definitely feels like in all of the work that we do, what comes through really strongly, both from the people we speak to who work in the sector, but also how we talk about the sector is that it is a true vocation. And that differentiating factors between working in retail or working in care will be that vocational drivers. And um, there's a really interesting piece of research, and we'll be running some events about this in the new year called Leading Through Values. And um, so we did a research report with ILM um, that took about a year to kind of comprise, and it was about how organisations who lead through values in terms of talent management strategies and um, will often outperform other areas because it is very much about embodying the values in terms of everything that they do and that values based recruitment and um, I'd be interesting Kate actually just to come and um, come to you on that kind of final point in terms of um, I guess within the sector really putting values at the forefront in terms of that practice and really communicating effectively and I know from my kind of uh, you know role in recruitment you'd often take job efforts and kind of rework them and, and really promote and kind of like sell that organizational vision and then find the right candidates that would fit that it was often about kind of like helping people communicate what they do and why they kind of have a particular culture and what they're looking for in terms of people who could you know work well and succeed in that type of culture it often felt like it was that kind of part of it that was you know for me a really motivating part of working in recruitment and um, do you see that a lot in terms of like people within this sector that actually sometimes it's about kind of really promoting those, those, those kind of values and taking that approach to recruitment to, to kind of identify and, and, and help kind of, I suppose, surface those candidates within the market. Yes, absolutely. Um, I have to say, I feel like it's, it's become more important than ever. Um, so we will now hear regularly about how um, somebody who is looking for a particular role within an organization and they'll they'll really they'll ask questions about what's the the purpose of that organization um what what was what's the value base that that organization um lives by and and if they experience during the recruitment process something that doesn't seem to match up with those values um, so if people talk about how they are um, a diverse and inclusive employer and yet they are um, the entire recruitment process um, doesn't look very diverse from the, maybe the panel that's interviewing them or the experience they have, mm. then individuals will call it out now. And it's um, it's been it's been quite interesting how important it is for that organisation to communicate what it is that they what difference they really want to achieve, because more and more people, particularly younger people, are saying that that's what matters most to them in terms of their their job. Salary is obviously important to all of us. It's what makes the world go around. But that purpose and mission of an organisation is the bit that we all need to sell. Absolutely. Yeah, no, that's a great point, actually. Thanks, Kate. And I think that that also was reflecting the research as well about um uh, you know financial kind of remuneration not being the only kind of driving force for people choosing organisations. Um, but also I think there's something important about kind of living those values authentically and I often found in recruitment as well it's about you know people who weren't successful in the application process ensuring things like they had feedback and they were kind of told in the right way because they then have you can have positive experiences of organizations even if you're not necessarily successful in that vacancy so I think there is something about kind of the whole process like you say from start to finish really reflecting the type of organization you are um, that's brilliant thank you so much Kate um, could could speak to you all day you're so knowledgeable <laughs> and have like such a, a deep insight into the markets and what's going on at the moment and what we will do just to kind of recap on the on the kind of key points there in terms of practical tools that can help you so um, and it's it's something Kate had, had spoke about in previous conversations. If you're working with an agency, use your agency like a consultant. They're there to help you, as you can see from kind of Kate's uh, knowledge. Recruiters have a lot of insight into the market and what's going on. If you're not sure, ask them, use them. That's what they're there for. Um, and um, they have a lot of kind of uh, tools available in terms of supporting you if you give them time to understand your organisation wholly and what's important to you. Whatever is important to you, make it important to the candidates and that's going to support with those recruitment practices. The Good Recruitment Guide, can't recommend it highly enough, but free resources which take you through the best practice um, in terms of the key areas of recruitment. Um, we'll send links around afterwards, but you can just look at the REC website and go to the employers tab there and you can see the details. So if you've got any questions afterwards, um, you know, please get in touch with us um, and we'll be able to, to kind of follow those up. But um, thanks ever so much for your time, Kate. That was super helpful. And um, yeah, I've certainly 
um, learned some things there that I wasn't expecting to as well. <laughs> Particularly, I think when I see those headlines about HGV driving, I'm going to look at it with a very different perspective. Um, and so thank you. And we're going to be joined next by um, one of my colleagues, uh, Joe Bell, um, who is our Adult um, Skills Partnership Manager. There he is. It's funny, isn't it, on Zoom? Because everyone kind of moves around when they're talking. So you think you're looking one place and then end up somewhere else. Um, thanks for joining us, Joe. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a really kind of, um, you know, great start to the session looking at some of the challenges that are affecting the sector at the moment. And, and it'd be great if you can just give us a bit of an overview in terms of the work that you're doing for City and Guild um, and the ways that um, the organisation is kind of trying to support some of those challenges that Kate talked about. And particularly, um, you know, as well as uh, Susanna had kind of mentioned earlier about that, how how to recruit people into the sector for the first time as well so how we can actually kind of attract talent and um, to, to address some of those challenges that we've, we've identified this morning. Thanks Anna. Um, yeah we've been looking at a concept called skills bridges really which I mean partly as a response to the pandemic and particularly focusing on certain sectors uh, social care and construction being, being the main two and it's all about um, enabling people to either enter the um, the new a new sector for the first time are to to, to transition from a, a sector. I mean, we, we've always taken kind of retail as a, a sector where loads of people were made redundant during the pandemic. Um, you know, where how would we recruit those and, and, and enable those people to kind of cross the skill, skill bridge into social care? Now, clearly, City and Guilds has got qualifications, apprenticeships, all the usual stuff to, to support that um, that you, you're all familiar with, and that's kind of where we excel and um, but we're looking at something else um something to really kind of be that first step in attracting people into the sector to help them to understand the realities of the sector to maybe bust some myths about working in the sector um but also um to give them kind of an understanding of what skills that they would need to be successful within within social care what skills they may already have that they, they might, may not have realized were useful in that sector and then what what development opportunities they may be able to um, take ownership of so working with employers um within social care we've developed um some new kind of on a on, new online course um called ready for social care now i'm not going to do the full i'll give you a, a little look at it and, and i'll talk a little bit more about so let's see so if i do that so and i think that's a good point actually joe as well like we were kind of mentioning about the um kind of making people aware of the skills that they've had as well so mm. often it's not always about teaching new skills it's about enabling people to recognize the skills they've had. and i think importantly giving the language around those skills as well and actually i think sometimes where people often uh, you know may have caring responsibilities in their day-to-day -day life but don't necessarily see that as something mm. that would hold value in the professional context so I think that's it's yeah. quite an exciting area isn't it to, to kind of work on there I'll hand back over because this looks great I'd love to find out a little bit more about this yeah so just just to be clear this isn't a qualification this isn't accredited there is no formal assessment within this this is basically a digital course where somebody that was interested but not sure about coming into the social care sector, whether that be entering the sector directly or starting um, an apprenticeship or maybe starting a level one preparing for social care course, whatever that first step might be, this is this is this is for them to learn about the sector, but also to test their assumptions and their readiness for the sector. It's been developed by um, a number of employers that we work with. And as you can see from the names of the modules, um, there's a welcome to the course. There's an about social care, about you. So this is an opportunity for them to reflect on their own skills and how um, transferable they are to the sector. The different jobs and progression opportunities within the sector, the essentials about working in the sector, um, and then some job search tips, what, what employers are looking for on the, that CV, what they want people to talk about in interview, an opportunity for reflection. So given, given that they've now kind of com nearly completed this course, which elements of that sector appeal to them, which elements do they feel like they're ready for. Um, and then signposting is some of the employees that we've worked with having their kind of recruitment links on there. This culminates in um, a digital credential, which I'll, I'll show you in a second. But just to give you a, a little idea of the kind of content in here, if we just look at about social care, for example, and 
so as you can see, this, some of the content is written. There are some videos within there. There are some nice click throughs. These are 10 things everyone should know about social care. And then we've got these nice little videos and I'm hoping that this will work on Zoom. But if we just... The sector is rich, diverse, exciting, interesting. You can work with somebody from birth to death. You experience so much, you become a friend, a part of the family, you provide support, encouragement, you have laughter and tears, and no two days are ever the same. I see social care as a key part of the fabric of our society. It is supporting and empowering people to live longer, more independent lives. The selflessness that the workforce has um, is amazing. It's a really rewarding sector and you'll work with probably the most passionate people on every level that I've ever seen. And what I mean by every level is um, from manager all the way down, everybody cares. I'll pause it there. So just to give you a flavour, so it is employers and people that work in the sector talking directly to this to this person um, throughout. And as you, it, within each module, there are multiple videos like this. The role, it's also supported by transcripts. So the idea is that this person's hearing from employers, from people that work in the sector about, about the pros and cons. You can see the next video there is difficult days in social care. So it doesn't shy away from some of the challenges of the sector. Um, and, and, and maybe after, after, after doing this course, the person will decide the sector isn't for them, but it's better, better to be able to identify that at this stage. So that's the course. Um, we're working with some employment organisations, people that are involved in the restart scheme, if you're aware of that, um, some training providers and employers um, um, with, uh, that are, are all interested in, in this course. And as I said, it does culminate in a digital credential. Now, Anna, has my screen changed now? Uh, no, it's still the same, still the same right. screen. I need to do like a reshare thing, don't I? So well, is... I think we're all still impressed that the video worked first time after. Well, that's, some, that's something. So let me. <laughs> so. Yeah. Okay. So and, and what they and what they get after completing yeah. that course is is this ready for social care. So the idea is that people that have done that course, it does not mean. I mean. We, we did deliberate about calling it ready for social care and what that what that means, but there's a clear explanation here about what the person's done. It does not mean that they have done a formal qualification in social care, um, but it means that they mentally they have prepared themselves for the sector and they are ready to take that first step into social care. So the idea is the person would be displaying this on their CV, on their social media profiles, they might email it to employers. Um, and it's an indicator that this person has made an effort to do this course, to, to research the industry and hear from employers. And actually, through the magic of digital credentials, um, they can actually find jobs uh, in the sector as well using the job links here. And again, I don't know if, um, does the screen change, Anna? Yeah, that's changing. Cool. Yeah. Okay. So you can see here, and I don't know if you're familiar with digital credentials on this call, but they're, they're amazing things. So straight away, we can see that within community care, there's 2,800 job openings posted on this. Uh, you can actually search for specific regions. So let's just look at the East Midlands, for example. And you can see care assistant roles within the East Midlands. And it, and it takes you through right to the actual job posting so not only is the person kind of researching and getting enthused about the industry but it can it can lead them through to these real real job postings um to, to demonstrate the kind of uh, the the abundance of um, vacancies out there so i'm going to keep it short and sweet but that's that's something so as employers i suppose it's look out for people coming through with with, with that and, and hopefully i've understand what it is but also if you want to work directly with any providers or employment organisations um, on that, then we, you know, we can certainly help to make those kind of links. 
Brilliant. Thanks, Joe. Um, and we'll be sending out details about the, the course as well as, as a kind of follow up. And if anybody's interested in finding out more um, or you might want to kind of put your perspective in terms of um, any future kind of iterations or courses that we do and, and share your experiences. We're always interested in, in hearing. Um, we can see Chelsea's put a note in the chat as well that the course looks fantastic for people that are new or unsure of the sector. Um, and how great it is to hear from first hand experience. And I think what really comes across so strongly um, and been involved in you know, a few of the conversations that led to the, the kind of creation of the course is just that passion from people working in the sector. And it's hard, like just listening to that video, like not to kind of just feel emotional straight away, isn't it? Because actually people really are so committed. And I think that's where actually um, enabling people and supporting them to really understand that true reflection from a first hand experience of, of what a career can really mean, like it is that true vocational kind of opportunity, I think is really important. So thanks ever so much for joining us and sharing that today, Joe. Um, like I say, anybody who's interested, we can put you in touch with Joe after the course as well. Um, and more than happy to, to kind of arrange a follow up conversation. Um, so bringing us almost to the close of our session today, um, I'd just like to, to kind of bring uh, back in uh, my colleague Geraldine, who's our industry manager for health and care. Um, there you are, Geraldine. Hiya. <laughs> um, thanks ever so much for, for kind of popping back on. And just um, just a, a little bit of a kind of overview. And I'm sure, you know, you many people on the call may already kind of know or have worked with you kind of already. Um, but just to give us a bit of a sense of kind of your role at City and Guild and that kind of wider support that we can give for people working in the sector in terms of the latest kind of insights, updates and um, kind of advice around kind of career pathways uh, within the sector. What's the kind of latest news? It'd be great just to, to give you the, the, the last couple of minutes to give us an overview of that oh sorry you're on mute and, and I should say as well, we, we do have um, another colleague who, who works with Geraldine, Susie, um, who's a uh, Wi-Fi and she's got a complete power cut due to the to the storm this morning. So <laughs> see, we have other colleagues available as well. I was hoping to join us, um, but but hopefully we'll be at the next session. Um, yeah, and, sorry, yeah. I've double muted myself <laughs> as usual. And then I thought I'd taken the, the headphones one off, but I didn't. So there you go. <laughs> Anyway, because, um, thank you Anna, but because this we're, we're a bit tight for time now, I thought actually I'd concentrate on one aspect of my role yep. that I really want to um, expand this year and it's one of my priorities. So I'm really excited about Ready for Social Care and um, to have been able to work as an organisation, as our organisation, being able to work really closely with a number of employers who've given their time and expertise to help us to, to, to pitch this, this, um, this programme in, in, in the right place. I want to expand that, really. So my role is uh, both inward facing and outward facing, but I... Uh, when I'm outward facing, my role is to support um, and listen to employers and stakeholders and to bring their knowledge of the sector back into City and Guilds and help us to develop qualifications, products and services that really, you know, um, <laughs> I, I can't. I can't. I can't think of the word I want because I'm so excited. But they're, re you know, they're really right. They deliver. The they, they deliver. They deliver. They, yeah. They <laughs> deliver the skills and uh, the knowledge that that uh, that staff need, not only in their first roles in in social care, but actually all the way up to to being a manager. But in order to do that, I need to be able to talk to employers employers need to be able to talk to me. So in the new year, so this is like an invitation really, in the new year, what we're intending to do, no, not, not even intending, but what we will do, and what I will do is to set up an employer reference group. So what I mean by that is I'm inviting employers to become a, a, a member of just a small group, but I want it to be representative of the sector, to be able to, for us to test things out. So at the moment, for example, we're developing two new level, um, two new qualifications, a level three and a level five. We're replacing existing qualifications. But, you know, we're getting lots of feedback from our customers, some of whom are employers, but not all of them. They're delivery centres, training providers and FE colleges, for example. But I want to be able to say to an employer, this is what we think our qualification needs to look like. What do you think? Will that help you? Will that help your staff to progress? 
will that help you to for your staff to provide a better service and that's the only way really that we can mm -hmm. um, ever get our our qualifications to deliver um properly uh, to meet the needs of employers and and um members of staff so that they feel as though they um are able to progress um you know to, to where they want to be yeah so, um, so that's my big that's my 2022 uh big ask it'll be it'll be the resolution that you will keep <laughs> all the other ones that we start in new year's they, they, that, they that's, don't last that's why i'm that's why i'm down <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> keep focused on just one thing. that it's but, but it, it, it sounds like a small thing but actually it's really not yeah. because um as i said unless we get that voice i mean you know i've worked in the sector but that was a long time ago and and i sort of feel as though i'm continuing to contribute to the sector by what i do which is why i love my job but i need to know that that um like what's happening today and what's happening yeah. on the ground so that's yeah. really really important to me absolutely and i would i would say you know second that i think um you know certainly kind of your, your passion and advocacy for, for kind of the sector comes across in in all the work at city and guilds and i think um in terms of next year that employer reference group um I, I would say that absolutely that employee voice is very authentically taken into that kind of qualification design into the product design that we have as an organization because city and guilds at its heart is very much about ensuring that um you know we are supporting people into the jobs that we are actually kind of um you know really meeting those kind of employer needs um and that kind of draws us to a close for today thank you so much Geraldine and, and we'll be hearing a lot more from Geraldine in our next session which is the 25th of January where we'll be looking a little bit more in detail about the kind of the, the skills development opportunities within the sector about the work that's kind of currently going on and about the support that's available and um, so you can hear more from Geraldine then which will be 11 o'clock on the 25th of January we'll send you some details out there we'll also send you some details about the employer reference group for anybody that would like to keep contributing and being part of that conversation um so just to kind of summarize the session today thank you so much for taking the time out of your days to join us today we really valuable and um, value the opportunity to to kind of bring a group of people together that are working within the sector to be able to kind of share the challenges um you know that are being felt across the sector from um, a number of different organizations thank you so much kate for giving us that um industry insights the the very latest <laughs> data i think it's the kind of you know the last week of November, you can't get um, any fresher data than that, can you? Um, and really great to hear the kind of support and resources that are available from the REC and some top tips about how to get the most out of your recruitment practices, whether that's delivering in-house recruitment or whether that's working with agencies. Um, thank you so much, Joe, for giving us an overview of that brilliant course, um, which is, is a fantastic kind of testament to the, to the teams and the employers that have come together to really kind of advocate and support people that would like to kind of work within uh, the sector and, and really choose that kind of true vocational path. Um, and also thank you just from City and Guilds as well for everybody that's working in the sector. We know how challenging it is and also um, how much we appreciate the work and the amazing work that you continue to do. Um, it's lovely to see you all. Um, I feel like I can't say happy Christmas because it's not close enough to Christmas, but <laughs> I'll go with the kind of, I hope you all have a lovely festive season <laughs> and look forward to hoping to see you in 2022. We'll send our contact details as well. Um, so if you'd like to get in touch with myself, with Geraldine or Jo, um, then um, you know please feel free to do so after the session. Um, if there's any follow-up questions that you have for, for kind of Kate at the IRC as well, you can send those to us and we'll pick them up with Kate. Um, so thank you very much. And oh, yep, Julie, Julie's put happy Christmas. That's fine. This is the first happy Christmas now of the year. <laughs> you can go happy Christmas. <laughs> Um, and look forward to seeing you next year. Take care. Thank you very much, everybody. <laughs>